Hellbeans by Jennifer Purcell Rosenberg Saturday began like any other. The kids had woken up early, noisily whispering at each other to be quiet, as they raided the cabinets for sugary cereal and tracked crumbs to the living room to watch YouTube videos of people playing video games on the TV. The cats had sprawled across the bed, taking up so much space that Miranda and her wife were both teetering on opposite sides. The dog was on the couch with the kids, sneaking as much spilled cereal as possible and causing peals of laughter every time he farted. Miranda had eventually gotten up and poured herself some micro-cold brew before reminding her offspring to sweep up the fallen crumbs. Once everyone was up and dressed, time was taken to make certain every one of the children had completed their homework. A little more focus was needed for their first grader's handwriting practice. The second grader had completed everything as assigned and was reading ahead in her advanced reading chapter book. The fourth grader was less than thrilled about learning the difference between acid and alkaline and just wanted to watch more YouTube. Everything was sorted by lunchtime and the kids happily devoured some riced cauliflower stir-fried with veggies and tofu. By two in the afternoon, Miranda was sitting on the porch half-heartedly reading over an expense report for work while the kids raced around the yard with their friends pretending to have a space battle. Miranda's wife, Kat, was pruning the rose bushes by the driveway, her thick curls pulled back into a puff at the nape of her neck. They had purchased purple roses with thick, vibrant, plum-colored hues, only to discover that the luxurious roses they had paid for were grafted onto a cheaper, smaller, red rose varietal. Miranda grinned quietly and patted the dog gently, while Kat could be heard cursing the garden center from across the yard. She was sure she had noticed the neighborhood busybody, Mr. Jenkins, peeking out from behind sheer green nylon curtains disapprovingly. But then, what else was new? Miranda and Kat's three children, Ruth, Simone, and Robin, were happily rolling around in the yard. Grass stains and smears of dirt covering their overalls and striped t-shirts the perfect outfit for any child. They were joined by the twins from the house on the left, Shelley and Adrian, and three kids from different houses across the alley behind their two-story craftsmen in a small Midwestern college town. Miranda had never expected to be able to have this life, and as she sipped her third cold glass of coffee, she mused over how lucky she was to be here and now, and not living in a time where she would have been punished for marrying the love of her life. As Kat walked up the path to the porch, shaking a branch with an anemic red rose and singing a song about painting roses red from an old animated movie, Miranda laughed heartily. If only she could capture all of these little moments on film. As she began to sing along to the jaunty tune, she realized the sky had darkened a bit despite no visible clouds. When she breathed in deeply to determine if the scent of impending rain was in the air, there was an unusual, almost tinny, scent instead. A hush fell across the neighborhood as everyone paused to assess the weather and wonder how far off the local forecast had been this time. The silence was pierced by the sounding of tornado sirens, blaring a robust, ear-splitting warning loud enough to carry from the small town and out to the neighboring farmland. People throughout the neighborhood peered toward the sky again, shrugging and shaking their heads when they saw there were no dangerous clouds, and it wasn't as if everything were that pre-tornado shade of green. The sirens continued to wail, and Miranda motioned for the kids to come inside. It was probably a computer error, if the switches had ever been upgraded. Miranda remembered the time a spider had gotten into the old analog switch box when she was a kid back in the 80s, and how the sirens kept going off randomly until someone figured it out. Nevertheless, 
on the off chance there really was a tornado, it would be best to have the kids inside. It would be quieter, too. Miranda counted off the children. Her three, the twins from next door, plus Bryn, Adara, and Jake. That was all eight of the usual crew. Who wants popcorn, she called, and they all shouted in unison, Me! As children began racing around the living room, she pulled the air popper down from its place in the cabinet and began measuring out popping corn. The sirens continued to blare outside, and Muggle, the lovable mutt they'd adopted from the local rescue, was howling along. Never a dull moment. She ran her hands through her short green hair, took a deep breath, and bounced on the balls of her feet a few times. She'd learned to channel her anxiety through action back in high school, which was probably why she'd been so active in sports. She realized the amount of coffee she regularly consumed wasn't helping the anxiety, but she didn't get as anxious as she used to. Having cat in her life had really made a difference. She smiled as the first kernels of corn began to frantically bounce against the clear yellow top of the popper and ping into the bowl she had waiting. While the corn was popping, Miranda noticed movement outside of the kitchen window. It looked like one of those shiny plastic balls for sale from a big wire cage in the supermarket, only an extreme shade of black, the kind of shade famous artists might get into a feud over. The ball was not moving normally, however. It was moving slowly through the air. Was it a balloon, perhaps? She shifted to look more closely and realized that there were several of these dark orbs lazily floating through the neighborhood. She heard the front door slam, and it must have slammed hard to be heard over the sirens, the kids, and the popping kernels. Cat ran into the room, short of breath, her amber eyes wide. Let's get the kids to the basement, she gasped. One of those floating things just swallowed Mr. Jeffries. Mr. Jeffries was the busybody neighbor who was always snooping around. He was always overly concerned about what everyone else in the neighborhood was doing, and he made a point of making passive-aggressive comments about having a same-sex couple on his street. If he had his way, women would marry men, stay home to mind the children, and never be caught with short green hair. So Miranda was one of his least favorite neighbors. Most people in the neighborhood enjoyed making jokes about how Mr. Jeffries could sod off when he complained about the lawns of those who lived around him. Despite the older man's cantankerous nature, Miranda had always made a point of being kind to him, assuming he must be a lonely soul to spend all of his time foisting his ideas on others. As Cat grabbed the bowl of popcorn and some board games to help shepherd the kids into the basement, Miranda went outside to see for herself what was happening. Mr. Jeffries was standing in the front yard of Miranda's house, staring directly at her. He was soaked with a glistening slime, his small side tufts of dull gray hair plastered to his ears, his skin shiny like a freshly waxed car. He was shuffling toward the house slowly, limb-shaking with obvious tremors. Miranda watched in horror as her senior neighbor opened his mouth as if to speak, and a viscous black ooze spilled out. With sirens still blaring and orbs still throating through the air, Miranda wanted to run inside and lock the door, but she felt rooted in place. As Mr. Jeffries shambled forward, it became obvious that his eyes, instead of being their usual pale, roomy blue, were now smaller, bulging versions of the deep black orbs. A sudden movement startled Miranda into action. Chris, the father of the twins currently hiding in her basement, had run outside frantically calling for his daughters. It's okay, Chris, she called. Shelley and Adrian are safe here. Relief washed over her stocky, red-haired neighbor as he waved his thanks. As he stood there, however, one of the orbs floating near him glommed on to his outreached hand. 
As he struggled to pull free, the orb began to melt and ooze, enveloping his arm. Chris's wife, Lisa, ran out of their house with a shotgun in hand. Let go of my husband, you freak, she screamed, and fired the gun. The shot passed right through, coming out the other side slowly, covered in the dark goo and floating away.